Hey everyone, for the 20th time, here I am at your service, Laszlo Montgomery here with another good one from the Tea History Podcast. Last time we convened, I was just about to start introducing some of the more famous oolongs that came out of China. Oolong teas. Man, there's so many to choose from. China oolong tea primarily comes from Taiwan and Fujian. In Fujian, there are the famous rock teas or yen cha of the Wuyi Mountains, where so much tea history happened. These are quite popular with the experts and amateurs like me, too. These are among my own personal favorites. Then in the south of Fujian, you have Tie Guan Yin Tea of Anxi. Then further south of there, you get into Guangdong Province, where they make Dan Cong Tea. Dan Cong, it's not a yen cha, a rock tea, but it's a nice oolong, and I'll get on that proverbial limb and say, it's far and away the most famous oolong grown in Guangdong province. Dan Cong comes from a place called Phoenix Mountain, Feng Huang Shan, just north of historic Chaozhou and Shantou, so you can be sure it's a heavy favorite of everyone from that region, and I'm guessing amongst the Hakkas in and around Meixian, too. I believe in all of Guangdong province, this must be that province's most famous tea, a very beloved oolong. You'll see with Dan Song tea, there are so many different flavor profiles and so many different grades of this tea. And something else that's special about Dan Song teas are that they come from trees, not bushes. And you need to wait until the trees are almost 60 years old before they're ready for action. And true blue, authentic Dan Song theoretically comes from a single tree, or more commonly, a single mother tree that provided all the cuttings needed to replant in the same tea garden or grove, offering consistency to the flavor. I have someone who used to work for me, from Shanto, and she brought me the occasional baggie of top-grade Dansong from her own personal stash that she gets from her relatives back home. Tie Guanyin comes from both Fujian and Taiwan, Its English name is actually Iron Buddha Tea. Guan Yin, of course, the beloved goddess of mercy. A lot of people pray to her. One version of the story concerning how this tea got its name, Tie Guan Yin, is because the tea is black, like iron, Tie, and pure and beautiful, like Guan Yin. Another story goes that in Shaxian, outside the city of Sanming in Fujian province, there was this old Buddhist temple with an iron statue of Guan Yin inside. The temple was all run down, and everyone in Sha Xian was so poor, no one could afford to rebuild it. But one of the locals went in twice a month to help clean it up and worship, and they would burn incense to the goddess. And then one night, the goddess Guan Yin appeared to him in a dream and told him to look inside this certain cave near the temple to seek a treasure that she had placed there for him, to thank him for his devotion. So he woke up the next morning and went to go search the cave. And in it, he found a single tea shoot, which he planted and took care of for several years. And when this bush was mature enough to yield its riches, the man discovered a fantastic brew. Cuttings were taken from this bush and were planted all around the area, including in Anxi, just a few hours away by car. Within a generation... Everyone in this region of Fujian prospered from growing this Tie Guan Yin Cha, as it became known, Iron Buddha or Goddess of Mercy Tea. One thing about oolongs, you really get a lot of bang for your buck. This varies a great deal depending on multiple factors, but generally speaking, you'll get two to three brews out of a single serving of most green and white teas, and that third steeping is going to be very light. But with oolongs, you can get as many as six to seven brews before they start to lose their distinctive flavor. Jinjun Mei, Golden Beautiful Eyebrow Tea. This is another very popular tea these days. It's a rock tea from Tongmu Village, Wuyi Mountains. Only the yato, the buds, are used for this tea. So it's very delicate looking to behold. Unlike other oolongs, the tea buds are fully oxidized, which technically makes Jinjun Mei a black tea rather than an oolong. This bud-only tea will set you back $12 to $700 an ounce, if that gives you any idea how much 
depth of quality there is in this and many other artisanal teas of this region. I randomly checked a good tea website, and they had real Jinjunmei tea for $35 for four ounces. That's $8.75 an ounce. The other, more famous of the Yencha rock teas of Wuyi Mountain are Rougui, Da Hongpao, Tie Luo Han, and one of my personal favorites, Shui Xian. There's also Shui Jingui and Bai Ji Guan. These are some of the main ones. A lot of tea lovers swear by these rock teas of the scenic Wuyi Mountain area. Again, having tried a few myself, I concur with this thinking. Like all these teas I've mentioned, they're all affordable and not going to set you back too much. And if you want to figure the cost on a per cup basis compared to coffee, it's a bargain, especially if you get more than one single steeping. I mentioned Da Hong Pao, Great Red Robe or Big Red Robe Tea. Now this one has a story or two attached to it. Da Hong Pao is a tea admired by tea people the world over. A very, very renowned tea. I love this stuff and always keep a supply on hand to treat myself every once in a while. The history of Da Hong Pao goes all the way back to the Song, but it achieved particular fame during the Ming Dynasty. There's so many legends with this tea. I don't know where to begin. Perhaps the most famous story says that there was this poor scholar on his way to the imperial palace to sit for the civil service exams. He got sick along the way in the Wuyi Mountain area and chanced upon a monk who took him in and nourished him at the monastery with this tea, their local brew. The scholar was able to recover and then made his way to the palace where legend has it he scored the highest of all the candidates that year. And also, at the same time the scholar was present in the capital, the mother of one of the Ming emperors was ailing and not expected to make it. Luckily, this scholar still had some of this tea that the monks had given him. The emperor's mother was given some of this brew, and wouldn't you know it? It was just like the Qianlong emperor's mom and the dragon well tea. She recovered from her illness, and so the emperor, to express his sincerest gratitude, sent a red robe to the monastery in appreciation to cover these three bushes that the Da Hongpao came from. Another version says the scholar, in appreciation for the way the monks had taken care of him and for facilitating all his success in the imperial exams, presented his red scholar's robes to them to be placed on the three tea bushes. Well, there's many other stories, all quite hard to believe, but they all go something like this and end with a big red robe being offered to honor and respect this great yencha, this rock or cliff tea. I didn't get into too much detail about Taiwan's great teas. I mentioned in an earlier episode about John Dodd and Li Chunsheng playing key roles in the 1860s in developing Taiwan's tea export industry. Taiwan is famous for oolongs, although black and green teas are also grown there. But it's Taiwan's oolongs that win all the prizes and are considered among the best. Let's look at a few more provinces and their famous teas. Guizhou, I didn't talk too much about. Quiet Little Guizhou is today the second largest tea producing province in China. And as far as green tea production, they're number one. Guizhou is famous for their Duyun, Mao Jian, which comes from Duyun, about two hours by car west of the capital, Guiyang. Mao Jian, again, we all know now, simply means there's only a bud and a single leaf. And this green tea isn't going to set you back a lot of money. Among the stories Duyun, Mao Jian has to tell, besides being Guizhou's most famous tea, is that supposedly it was named by the great helmsman himself. Chairman Mao, as the story goes, prior to being called Duyun Mao Jian, it was known as Yu Gou Cha, fish hook tea, because of the hooked shape of the dried buds. Well, some of this local tea was presented to Mao as a gift, and so delighted was he, Mao renamed Yu Gou Cha as Duyun Mao Jian Cha. The locals will tell you among its characteristics are the three yellows, the leaves, the tea liquor, and a taste that they describe as yellow. 
Like other Mao Jian teas, it has the name Fur Tip in its English name, so it's also marketed as Du Yun Fur Tip Tea. Guizhou's other famous teas are Guiding, Yun Wu Cha, and Mei Tan Ya, all greens. Yun Wu means clouds and fog, or clouds and mist. So you'll also see it marketed as Guiding Clouds and Mist Tea. The Mei Tan Ya tea is sold as Guizhou Emerald Tips. If some of you recall, from many years ago, I bought some of this particular tea and sold it through one of my tea trade partners via the China History Podcast. Now let's take a look at one of Guizhou's next-door neighbors. Guangxi is most famous for their Liu Bao black tea. Actually, Liu Bao, it's closer to Pu'er than red tea because they do a kind of Wadui post-fermentation process. Liu Bao is in the eastern part of Guangxi, near the border with Guangdong. It's a small township, very remote, and it's not that easy to get to. They make this specialty up there in Liu Bao, but demand far exceeds what they can produce. So Liu Bao tea is sort of a type that is produced in many of the surrounding areas of Liu Bao. Chinese immigrants who worked the tin mines in Malaysia in the 1890s and into the 20th century will remember this tea that was shipped in big quantities to the workers there. Liu Bao, like every tea I mentioned, has multiple grades, so you get what you pay for. Remember last episode when I discussed Pu'er tea? I mentioned they discovered this Wadui process in the 1970s, and it revolutionized the Pu'er tea industry. It's said that the good people in Yunnan learned this Wadui process from the tea masters up there in Liu Bao. I've been told on good authority. If you want to get the full Liu Bao tea cultural experience, don't go to Guangxi. Word on the street is that Malaysia is the place where this type of tea is particularly popular and still widespread and ingrained in the tea culture there. Maybe six hours away by car from Liu Bao to the west, about halfway to the Guangxi capital of Nanning, is the city of Guiping. Now, for those of you who listen to the China History Podcast, you're probably familiar with this historic city. This is where the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom had its beginnings. And it was there in Guiping where Hong Xiuquan and his fellow rebels began to organize. They make Guiping Xishan tea there. This is a green tea of Guangxi. Liu Bao and Guiping Xishan are probably the two best-known Guangxi teas. Guiping Xishan tea, like so many we've mentioned going back to Wu Li Zhen's time, all had their humble beginnings in Buddhist temples. Xi An, it's a temple there in Guiping, built during the early Qing, and Guiping Xishan tea is their famous offering to the world of great China green teas. Let's move on to Sichuan. Wu Li Zhen, during the midway point of the first century BCE, planted the seven tea plants on Meng Dingshan. He's credited with getting everything started in Sichuan province as far as the tea industry was concerned. Remember the story of the famous Gan Lu tea? It was called Gan Lu tea because it was cultivated during the Gan Lu era. It's one of the seven eras of the Han Emperor Xuan. Sichuan is famous for green teas, black teas, and for all those tea bricks or bian cha that we spoke about in earlier episodes of this tea series. It's, it's also famous for its tea culture. When I was last in Sichuan, I stayed in Chengdu for about a week and checked out the tea scene up close. Someone took me to Renmin Gongyuan, People's Park. I opted out of having my ears cleaned, but while I was there, I did have myself a nice Changzui Hu experience. I didn't mention the Changzui Hu. This is one of my favorite little slivers of Chinese tea culture. It originated somewhere in the eastern part of Sichuan, towards the end of the Qing, beginning of the Republican era. I don't know if you've ever seen one of them before. The pots that I've seen were all made of copper. Chang means long, and zui means mouth, or in this case, a spout of a teapot. And a hu, well, it means a teapot. So chang zui hu, a long spout teapot. So the defining characteristic of this teapot 
is its long spout, about 33 inches or 85 centimeters. I read one of the purposes of the long spout was to offer the tea a chance to cool as it made its way out the other end and into the customer's teacup. Now, the thing about this whole art is that there are about 18 popular kung fu poses that the one dispensing the tea will use when they pour it into your cup. With each pour, they dramatically and stylistically pose in these many kung fu stances, and they pour the tea into your cup from behind their back, over their head, twisting sideways, and in all kinds of other poses. And each time they would refill your cup out of that 33-inch long spout, right into your little teacup on the table. Nary a drop is spilled. I'm a sucker for a Chang Tui Hu performance. The first time I saw that was in 1990 in Beijing at a Sichuan restaurant. I think it may have been at Douhua Zhuang. It just blew me away. And here I am, more than three decades later, still talking about it. Sichuan is sort of a general term for the province. Chongqing does it this way, and in Chengdu, they do it that way. Some parts of Sichuan are mostly all ethnic minority people. It's a huge province. Used to be over 120 million people living there until Chongqing was peeled away and made a municipality in 1997, reporting directly to Beijing. There are still more than 80 million people living in Sichuan province. That's about a quarter of the uh, entire U.S. population. Frankly, not until I began to seriously study tea did I ever look upon Sichuan as much of a tea place. So bright does the tea light shine in China's eastern provinces of Zhejiang, Jiangsu, Fujian, and Anhui. Where Chinese tea is concerned, Sichuan these days may seem like an afterthought. In parts 1, 2, and 3, you were able to see how critical Sichuan was in taking the initial baby steps to establish the art of tea in China. It all began in Sichuan. In the first episode, I called Sichuan the Yuantou for tea in China, and therefore the world. It was also the center of the Cha Ma Gu Dao, the ancient tea horse road. The contribution of Sichuan's tea farmers and tea artisans, especially in the early days, was so critical to the evolution of tea. Those tea masters in Sichuan would patiently, season after season, gradually turn that bitter tu into sweet cha. Fortunately, the Yangtze River ran right through this breadbasket of China, and eastward, along the Yangtze River Valley, this expert knowledge flowed. The most famous teas of Sichuan all came out of the Mengding Mountain area. Mengding Shan Xueya is a rare yellow tea. In English, this would be Mount Mengding Snow Buds. Xueya means snow bud. The other better known Sichuan teas are Mengding Ganlu or Mengding Sweet Dew Tea. There's also Zhu Ye Qing or Bamboo Green Tea, Qing Cheng Shan Snow Bud, E Mei Shan Mao Feng, and E Mei Shan Bai Ya. Bai Ya means white bud. E Mei Shan, Mount E Mei, of course, one of the four sacred mountains of Buddhism in China. Tea is grown there. All of these teas from Sichuan can easily be purchased online. In Lu Yu's classic of tea, he mentions about 50 teas. And of those 50, about 40% of them came from Sichuan. Another one of the most popular of the great and famous teas of China is Bi Luo Chun from Jiangsu province, near the Lake Tai area. I'd say that didn't have to be that province's entry for best-known tea. Bi Luo Chun translates to Green Snail Spring. It's one of those gorgeous little bud-set teas that appear all tiny, twisted, and curly, like the meat you pull out of a snail's shell with a toothpick, for anyone who's ever enjoyed that. It's a green tea. This one's maybe a little more expensive than your average artisanal green teas, but not by much. And again, on a per-cup basis, it's still cheaper than coffee by a mile. It's said that the Kangxi Emperor himself named this tea. Now, I don't want to carve this in stone or anything, but Longjing, Luan, and Bi Luo Chun are considered the three 
top of the pops as far as China's most famous and admired green teas go. I would say, go find your own top three. But these three, they sure get the most shine. Jiangxi province doesn't get the respect it deserves. Their best in show is probably Ming Mei. This tea is grown in Wuyuan County, just east of Jingdezhen and south of Huangshan, Yellow Mountain. This is northernmost Jiangxi province, and this is another one of those Mei teas. Mei means eyebrow, teas that have that slender, delicate arch to the dried leaves are often called something or other Mei. I just mentioned Jinjun Mei, golden, beautiful eyebrow tea. Tea from this part of Jiangxi and Wuyuan County has been enjoyed by all the royals in the imperial palace since the time of the Song Dynasty. So this one goes way back, even to the Tang, because Lu Yu praised this tea. Hey, and remember Taiping Hokui that won that award at the 1915 World Expo in Panama? Well, Wu Yuan Ming Mei Tea won a gold medal there also. I don't know, perhaps it was one of those things where everyone got an award. Wu Yuan was once crowned the most beautiful village in China. I'll have you know. The other big tea from Jiangxi is Lushan Yun Wu. Lushan, of course, one of the most historic cities in PRC and Communist Party history. This tea comes from Jiujiang on the western side of Lake Poyang. Lushan Yun Wu has been a tribute tea since the time of the Song. Zhu De himself after tasting this famous tea of Jiangxi province, was inspired to write a poem. Lu Sha Yun Wu Cha, Wei Nong, Xing Po La, Ruo De Chang Shi Yin, Yan Yan Yi Shou Fa. The flavor of Lu Sha Yun Wu tea is strong and intense. If you drink it for long, it is a way to attain longevity. Zhu De, ladies and gentlemen, founder of the Red Army, lived to the age of 89, so... He knew what he was talking about when endorsing this famous tea of Jiangxi province. I still haven't mentioned Hubei and Hunan. Plenty of tea is grown there, too. In between Yichang and Jingmen in Hubei is the county of Yuan'an. This is where Hubei's famous yellow tea, Yuan'an Lu Yuan, is grown. Yuan'an is the name of the county, and Lu Yuan is the name of the temple there. The other famous and quite ancient tea of Hubei, this one goes all the way back to the Tang, is Anshi Yulu. This comes from south of Yichang at the bottom of Hubei on the Hunan border. Anshi Yulu is special because not only is it incredibly old, but they use a steaming method to process the tea that stopped being used after the Tang dynasty. Now, don't let Laszlo Montgomery fool you. I've never tried either of them, but you can buy them on the internet at some of the web stores that sell tea. Hunan is the home of the very special Jinshan Yinjan tea. Chairman Mao also liked this one. It's another yellow tea, and as yellows go, this one is considered the top one. It's quite similar to Bai Hao Yinjan tea, one of the best known white teas from the province that brought us white tea, namely Fujian. Yinjun, again, means silver needle. That means it's an all-bud tea. Junshan Yinjun is one of the top ten famous teas of China. Actually, I think there may be more than ten teas that claim to be in the top ten. It's grown on Junshan Island, located in beautiful and historic Dongting Lake. Dongting Hu. The annual production of Junshan Yinjun is about 500 kilos a year. And as far as this tribute tea's history, it also goes back to the Song. I've seen it for $25 for 100 grams. Rare as it may be, it's still affordable. I think I've covered most of the marquee teas of China so far. I skipped over a 1,000 or so, and I hope you won't hold that against me. You know, if you didn't know anything about the history of tea before you started streaming episode one, then for sure... You have tons of material for that next cocktail party or mixer. I myself went more than half a century before I was seriously turned on to tea. And after more than a decade of testing the waters, I'm all settled in. Honestly, I'm not much of a wine drinker. In fact, even to say not much of a wine drinker is an overstatement. All these years, I saw with how much passion 
So many people spoke of wine and of their wine experiences. I never could be part of that. But now, with tea, I found it's exactly the same. And as far as the history of tea goes, I hope you're leaving the table fully satisfied. It really is a great story, especially in the context of that most famous statement about tea, that after water and air, it's the most consumed substance on the planet. In that context, the story is particularly poignant. If it were so easy to figure out the process, then there wouldn't be anything special about tea. It would be like orange juice. Pick the orange, squeeze it in a glass. With Camellia sinensis, it wasn't so evident. It took a few thousand years to figure out most of the secrets locked inside. But you have to hand it to human beings in general, and the Chinese in particular. They sure are good at figuring things out. Yeah, the first Neolithic or Bronze Age people who lived where tea trees grew wild all knew these leaves were special. Thankfully, China had a nice, long history, and amidst all the wars, disunity, famines, plagues, rebellions, changes in the dynasties, despite all that, basically the culture always kept on chugging along, always moving forward, and tea was part of that historic process. We saw in these episodes how it really took a while before tea or tu evolved from this bitter brew into the cha beloved of poets. From the time of the mythical Shen Nong to the Tang Taizong Emperor was 3,360 years. That means it went from some legend of raw tea leaves purging poisons from Shen Nong's body into a beverage that was so good Emperors demanded that the best of every kind there was be sent to them first. It took 33.6 centuries to go from Shannong to Lu Yu, and another 700 years to get from Lu Yu to the rock teas of Wu Yishan. It wasn't easy, and all the secrets took their time before they were discovered. I can't recommend enough the six-part CCTV documentary series called Yi Pian Shu Ye De Gu Shi. I don't know if it has an English title, but it translates to The Story of a Leaf. This documentary did a great job, visually, of presenting tea and showing how special it is. I'll have links to that and a whole other bunch of resources for you to explore in the show notes at teacup.media. My hope these past 20 episodes was that I could offer you, my good-looking and brilliant listeners, a chance to get an appreciation for tea's history. All throughout, I've encouraged all of you who maybe aren't into tea yet, if your interest has been piqued from the episodes presented in this podcast program, the resources out there to guide you and accompany you on your little tea journey are plentiful and authoritative. That's all I have for you for this episode and about the history of tea in China. Let me close in saying that if this podcast inspired you to go learn more about tea, the internet abounds with experts, blogs, videos, and resources that can teach you everything there is to know about everything there is to know about tea. And if you want to sample all the teas I mentioned, you're in luck, because as long as it's in stock, you can get it online, delivered fresh to your door. Let me close with a tea poem that sort of says it all for me. Now stir the fire and close the shutters fast. Let fall the curtains, wheel the sofa round. And while the bubbling and loud hissing urn throws up a steamy column, and the cups that cheer but not inebriate wait on each, so let us welcome a peaceful evening in. And I wish all of you, my longtime China History Podcast listeners, and those of you who were attracted to this Tea History Podcast because of the attractiveness of the topic, I hope you all get to enjoy that peace and serenity from a quiet evening in, enjoying a nice cup of jia, tu, chuan, shu, ming, cha, chai, tea, or whatever you call it in your language. Enjoy. Take care, everyone, and I'm hoping you'll maybe consider joining me next time for another exciting episode of the Tea History Podcast.